I speak to you in the name of the living Christ. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for rising and choosing to come here, perhaps watch from your home, to be a part of this Easter celebration of hope, hope that meets despair, of love that is stronger than hate, of life that awaits us on the other side of death. This is an audacious faith, and it always has been. Before going further on behalf of all of us gathered here, I'd like to take a moment to thank those who have worked so hard to make this day and this place one of sacred beauty in sound and sight in a month when three African-American churches in Louisiana were destroyed by arson, the world watched as Notre Dame Cathedral was engulfed in flame, and an Easter morning when three churches, among other buildings in Sri Lanka, were bombed, we realize the precious power of sacred space. Of course, we believe that the living God cannot be contained in structures built by human hands, and we believe that not fire, not arson, not a bomb can destroy living faith. Easter morning asks us to embrace living faith. I'd like to speak to you about living faith. Now, if you're here today, not at all convinced that what Christians celebrate is, is true on Easter, or even if it is true, if it matters, if you're, something's happened in your life or in our world that's caused you to doubt what you once believed or what you thought to believe, you believed was true, or if you want to believe, but simply can't wrap your head around what people describe as their faith in God, or even if you're not in the zone, as they say, but just trying to make it through the day and somehow you wound up here, trust me, you are not alone. You are not alone among practicing Christians because faith without doubt, as they say, is faith without a pulse. Every one of us, no matter how confident we look on the outside, carries our share of doubt and worry and unresolved pain and the weight of burdens that others do not know. And it has always been so. I grant you that this is not an easy time to be a person of faith, if there ever was one. Our forebears didn't have such an easy time of it, you know, and thinking back on all that's happened in the past year alone and is happening now, we, we don't know what the future will bring. But then again, the first witnesses to the resurrection had it tough too. I've spent the better part of this week reading side by side the four written accounts of that first Easter morning and taken together, they paint a scene not of triumph, but of sorrow and fear at first, followed by chaos and confusion, to which I suppose most of us could relate. But I would say to you that this is also a fine time for faith. It may even be the best time, particularly for faith in resurrection. For resurrection is the assurance of God's empowerment and presence in and through the worst that can happen to us. Those who promote Christianity as a faith of ease and triumph and prosperity alone are not reading their gospels carefully. Christianity is a faith that says that God suffers alongside us, that Jesus' primary solidarity is with suffering and walks with us there, carrying us through, not in arrogant triumph, but in quiet amazement that life indeed can be lived after something precious is taken from us. The grace and mercy of Christ meets us 
in the crucible of our real life, where real things happen, not all of them easy. But those are the times that faith, living faith, is for. Peter Gomes was the late great professor of ethics and the chaplain at Harvard University, and he used to preach essentially the same sermon every spring to the students at Harvard, which he entitled, How Are You Going to Live After the Fall? Innocent pagans that most of them are, he wrote about that sermon in a book entitled The Good Life, they assume that I'm asking them what their plans are after September, but I'm not. I'm asking them what they're going to do after their first dreams fall from the sky. What are you going to do, I ask them, when you don't get the job, when you don't get the girl or the boy, when you're brushed aside or hurt, when your children rise up to treat you as you treat your parents? What are you going to do? The good life, I say to them, that you rightly seek must serve you in your most difficult, desperately hard times. It must help you to cope in your moments of doubt and despair. If what you live by does not serve you then, it is no good for you, even in the good times. Followers of Jesus put our faith in resurrection. And I'm not merely talking about what happened to him, a long time ago, although I'll start there. And nor am I referring to what happens to us when we die alone, although I'll get to that as well. But what I want to describe to you now is how we can experience in life resurrection, the experience of resurrection now. And here's the thing. You don't have to be a Christian or a believer of any kind to experience this. For resurrection is God's way with us. It's embedded in creation. But once you experience resurrection, though, and recognize it for what it is, you can at least understand what keeps a life-giving, self-sacrificing love for others' faith in Jesus alive in the midst of everything we human beings have done and continue to do in the name of Jesus to discredit him. In the words of the Franciscan priest Richard Rohr, the risen Christ is not a one-time miracle, but a revelation of a universal pattern. Love is the energy that sustains the universe, and it's moving us toward a future of resurrection. We don't need to call it love or God or resurrection for its work to be done. So let's take a look at those accounts for the pattern of resurrection that we might know. All four accounts agree that the morning began not in triumph but in grief. So the first thing to remember about a resurrection experience is that it too must begin there, in a death, a loss of something or someone so profound that a part of us dies too. And the second thing to remember, as I mentioned, is that there's a certain amount of chaos and confusion involved. Resurrection, it turns out, is a pretty messy process. And I don't know how you feel about that, but for me to be reminded that that's where God shows up is somehow validating and a huge relief. And that's the third thing that these ancient stories tell us about resurrection, that in some real way, in the midst of the worst that can happen and the chaos that follows, God shows up. I don't know how else to describe that. God shows up for us and with us and sometimes even through us. And not because of anything that we do or don't do. In fact, typically God shows up in resurrection where we least deserve it. The wondrously articulate Nadia Boltz Weber describes it this way. God keeps reaching down into the dirt of our humanity 
and resurrecting us from the graves we dig for ourselves through our violence, our lies, our selfishness, our arrogance, and our addictions. And God keeps loving us back, back to life over and over and over. And the last thing I'll say about this pattern of resurrection is that it generally comes with an invitation to pay it forward, to show up ourselves for someone else, as what St. Paul describes as being Christ's ambassadors. Christians, quoting Richard Rohr again, we are meant to be the visible compassion of God on earth. That's what Christians should be, not those who think they're going to heaven. And whenever we do this, whenever we show up and get close enough to other people's suffering so that that suffering actually changes us, then we're taking up with Christ resurrection work. It's what Dr. Martin Luther King called redemptive suffering or suffering in the service of someone else's life. Now, this is not an easy path, but I tell you, once you've seen it and you've had a taste of it, nothing quite adds up after that. Probably 15 years ago now, the writer Anne Lamott wrote an essay about this search and commitment to life in an, in, a, in an essay she entitled, Why I Make Sam Go to Church, which when I was a parish priest, I had as required reading for parents seeking baptism for their children. Sam was Anne's young son, and she writes that Sam is the only kid who he knows who has to go to church, and he rarely wants to. Well, that's not exactly true. The truth is he never wants to go. What young boy would rather be in church on weekends rather than hanging out with a friend? And it doesn't help for me to remind him that once he's there, he actually enjoys it. Doesn't help to remind him that he genuinely cares for the people there and they care for him. All that matters is that he alone among his friends is forced to spend Sunday morning in church. And you would think, she goes on, noting the bitterness, the resignation that he was being made to sit through a six-hour Latin mass. Or you might wonder why I make this strapping, exuberant boy come with me most, most weekends. And if I were to ask, this is what I'd say. I'd say I make him because I can. I outweigh him still by nearly 75 pounds. But, but that's only part of it. The main reason is that I want to give him what I have found in the world, which is a path and a little light to see by. You see, most of the people that have what I want, which is to say purpose and heart and balance and gratitude and joy, these are people with a deep sense of spirituality they may be Buddhists or Muslims, Christians, Jews, but they're people banding together to work on themselves and for human rights. They follow a brighter light than the glimmer of their own candle. They're part of something beautiful. Our funky little church is filled with people who are working for peace and freedom, who are out there on the streets and they're inside praying and they're home writing letters and they're showing up at shelters with huge platters of food. And when I'm at the end of my rope, the people at my church tie a knot in it and help me hold on. For any of us who feel called to follow Jesus, we have this extraordinary privilege and responsibility to live resurrection faith, staking our lives on its assurance that God meets us in whatever happens and guides us on that path with just enough light to see by. If we're looking for something quick and huge and dramatic and easy, we're not gonna find it here. Resurrection is a much more subtle process than that, it, and it never glosses over the hardships we must endure. It feels, 
It feels more like a wind shifting, or the gradual turning of midnight to dawn. It feels like a seed breaking through the muddy earth after a long winter, a stranger appearing out of nowhere to say just what you needed to hear. Sometimes it feels like a second chance, other times like a new possibility where there was just moments before only a closed door. Resurrection also takes time, um, a lot of time, which is why we Christians celebrate it not only on Easter Sunday with our best clothes on and our finest preparation, but also on the most ordinary of days when it's all we can do to crawl out of bed and throw a pair of jeans on. Easter isn't a day for us. It's a way of life. And so after today, followers of Jesus will show up here or in other places of worship next week and the week after that and the one after that. And in between, we're going to be living our lives and doing what we can do to bring good to the world. We'll march sometimes. We'll cook food. We'll read stories to our children. We'll make appointments with our legislators. We'll go to the theater. We'll listen to glorious music and take a walk in the park and we'll work for reconciliation and peace. You see, resurrection is everywhere. And after today, we'll give thanks for the excuse to throw a really great party and invite all of you. But then we'll go back to living, living it, even when it's hard and a little scary. You see, nothing worth doing is completed in a day or our lifetime. Richard Niebuhr said that back in the Cold War days. Nothing worth doing can be completed in a lifetime. Therefore, we are people saved by hope. And nothing true or beautiful or good makes sense in its immediate context. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we are saved by love. And no virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe. Therefore, we must be saved from that final form of love, which is forgiveness. Now, this is not an easy faith, but it's a good one. In the best sense of that word, it's full of grit and promise and a fierce calm. Christ is not a panacea. He's not a platitude. He is an authentic presence of love, forgiveness, and empowerment. We don't live easy lives, but they are good. As St. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am who I am, and God's grace has not been in vain. It's not an easy faith, but it's our faith. It's not an easy time, but it's our time. And remember, your faith need never be as strong as what we put our faith in, which is the mystery of resurrection, the empowering presence of Christ, a light to go by, and a way to live. Now, one final word as I bring this to a close. And, and this is about the mystery that lies beyond our physical death, about which I know nothing firsthand. But I speak now especially to those who might be grieving the loss of a loved one taken from you too soon, or those of you like me who can feel overwhelmed by the amount of senseless death in our world, or perhaps you are facing your own crossing over. No one knows for certain what lies beyond the grave. But I have come to trust the ancient human intuition that is embedded in spiritual traditions across humankind, that there is another side. There is another realm. There is a place. It's not a physical one as we know it, nor one that we could ever grasp from here, but there is some place where souls are safe and spirits live on. 
St. Paul wrote, it is not for this life only that we have hope, and thank God for that. One tangible fruit of living faith in resurrection as we go along, intentionally practicing it over time, is that it gives us a way of imagining what it will be like at the final crossing for ourselves and a way to entrust those who must go before us. The mystics assure us that the distance between us and that place is not as great as we imagine it to be. And sometimes we'll feel what can only be described as proximity to it. Should you experience that, I think you can trust it. And when your time comes to surrender this life, I think you can lean back and trust that Christ's arms will be there to hold you and bring you home. And in the meantime, go and live your life. Invest in the places and people and offerings that are worthy of your life and will sustain you in the hardest times. Dare to believe that Christ has your back now and when you need it most and that his resurrection means, if nothing else, that there is nothing on this earth, nothing in life or death that can separate you, separate any of us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen.